and I'm reading it, this is the first time I've read my own book. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of like if, is it, if you do a TV yeah, or you don't want to see yourself on TV. You just say, how was I? <laughs> how was I? Are we ready? Are we ready to go? Oh, Brian Cuban, welcome to Washington D.C. It's great to have you here. Uh, thank you for coming. It's great to meet you. Are you. Are you a frequent visitor to Washington? Not as much as I like, and certainly not since uh, COVID. But my wife and I, as you're going to be honest, we, we get we've gotten here a, a few times. And as I was telling you, I've. Uh, Run the New York State or uh, the Marine Corps Marathon twice. So, and then my uh, uncle used to be superintendent of schools in Arlington. So, I got into quite a bit. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's always good to be back. Delighted. Looked around in my run today with my artificial head. Delighted to uh, delighted to have you here. The uh, mm -hmm. where did your where did your run take you this morning? Uh, I tried to I tried to track parts of the Marine Corps Marathon that I can remember. So I went up by the Washington Monument and then back down towards the Capitol and ran, you know, a few moves just to get a few more miles in. So, uh... That, that jog along the National Mall is irresistible. Yes, yes, that was nice. That was nice. And it was, uh, just nice to get back and, uh, just get out there. Yeah. The, the... Your book, The Ambulance Chaser, uh, is the subject of conversation tonight and we're, uh, to give everyone a flavor of uh, some of the characters and themes in your book. I'm going to ask you to read a few paragraphs for us from an early part of the book where you're setting up uh, some of uh, some, some of my favorite themes. Sure. Well, where's the teleprompter? <laughs> <laughs> sure, okay, so we're going to read from chapter 8. I push through the revolving door to the crowded hotel lobby. Guests are lounging on plush couches and seated at coffee tables. Interlocking conversations echo off the crystal chandeliers and through a cavernous space that from vintage photos I've seen doesn't appear much different from the early 1900s. I wonder if someone is still spends weekends here. Our one-time love mess usurped by some rich lobbyist asshole from DC. <laughs> <laughs> I heard she's gay. Now I heard she's dating him. I put my teeth in him now. Exhale, sorry. Don't do this to yourself, Jason. She's entitled to move on with her life. I spy a newspaper on the table and take a seat. A Heather Brody retrospective takes up the bottom half of the front page, recounting candlelight vigils, the $100,000 reward offered by her parents, and her father's tragic suicide. The article closes with remembrances from her high school classmates and longtime residents of Squirrel Hill, who knew her as a child. Retired bakery owner Josiah Cohen said, she was such a sweet young girl coming in with her mother on Thursday evenings to buy their Sabbath chella. Our community has seen so much death and pain. I hope they catch her killer so we can begin to heal. Buried on page five is another eye-catching word. According to the University of Pittsburgh campus police, an unidentified male attempted suicide by jumping off the fourth floor out of the fourth floor classroom at the Cathedral of Learning around 4 p.m. yesterday. He was transported to Shadyside Hospital and his current condition is unknown. I take another glimpse around the lobby and smile at the memory of our rainy night. This was our hotel. I tuck the paper under my arm. Thanks, Brian. The uh, we meet two important characters in your book in that passage uh, when Jason walks into the William Penn Hotel. One is the, the city of Pittsburgh uh, and its landmarks, uh, and the other is the, the Pittsburgh Jewish community, Sabbath Chala and Squirrel Hill. Uh, and I wanted to get you to talk a little bit about those two vivid themes, so vivid I would call them almost characters in your book, uh, and, and their importance to you. Sure, well, I've lived in Dallas for many, many years, but I was born and raised in Pittsburgh, and so much of my experiences uh, were in Pittsburgh with my uh, growing up in Squirrel Hill, which is a predominantly new Jewish community uh, with my grandparents. And then, uh, then moving to the suburbs of um, Pittsburgh and Mount Lebanon, which is about nine miles south. And a lot of my fondest memories were my, was with my grandfather, grandmother and grandfather in Squirrel Hill, going into the bakery where people bought their Sabbath job, 
going into the butcher shop where people spoke Yiddish and they spoke Russian and having and they had numbers on their tattoos on their arms that I didn't understand as a young boy. And all of these things were so vivid in my mind and I've never forgotten them. And so how could I make this part of the book? As I said in an interview, I've lived in Dallas for decades, but I still believe black and gold. And so much of my heart remains in Pittsburgh. And so I wanted to cre recreate that environment because Pittsburgh is truly an underrepresented city in all of it. And it's certainly in thriller writing and for sure in legal thriller writing. And so I wanted to bring Pittsburgh to life for the masses who may have never set foot there and hopefully create as you said, in a character where they actually can feel the city. And one of the places that uh, I wanted to recreate was the William Penn Hotel, which has been around since the late 1800s. And the inside has many of the same uh, items and many of the same decorations from the late 1800s. It looks like a giant train station. If you've ever been to Union Station in New York, with the, it's kind of reminded me of that. And that's why I created the uh, recreated the William Penn Hotel. And you have another another passage just, just before that that takes place in the in, in the University of Pittsburgh Law School, which which I didn't know was so picturesque. Yes, yes. Uh, you, do you, are you talking about the Cathedral of Learning? Yes. Yes, yes. That's not the law school. The Cathedral of Learning is uh, one of the it is the tallest university structure in the world. And it's actually on the cover of the book. And so it is, uh, it, it is, I want to say about 38 or 39 floors, and this is where one of the, uh, the premier inciting incidents of the book takes place when one of the characters, David, uh, maybe falls, maybe jumps, maybe gets thrown out of a window of the cathedral of learning, and kind of begins the cycle for Jason of the story. You mentioned Pittsburgh Jewish community, and uh, I found it interesting that many of the characters in the book are not only not only Jewish immigrants or from Jewish immigrant families, but very specifically Ukrainian. Yes, uh, and you couldn't you couldn't have imagined when writing this that that Ukraine would be in the headlines when when, when the book uh, came out. But can you tell us a little bit about about your connection to Ukraine and sure. and, and, and how that how that uh, injected itself into the Ukrainian uh, sure. and the Americans in the book. And, and, and for, for and full disclosure, there's nothing political about my using Ukraine in the book. This was more about my family history. Uh, back on my, my great aunt, my grandfather, his, uh, his, his siblings all were born in a town called Nova Salita, Romania. Nova Salita, Romania is now part of the Ukraine. And back during that time, uh, most of them immigrated to the United States through Ellis Island, and the usual story of Jewish immigrants. But the sister stayed in Noah Salita, Romania. In the, in the summer of 1941, the Romanian army, which was at that time aligned with Nazi Germany, swept through uh, many parts of Romania and murdered all the Jews. And I lost my great aunt and her two children and her husband in the Holocaust. Holocaust. They're murdered, and they are now in a mass grave in Novoselitia, which is in now in the Ukraine. So I wanted to incorporate, you say you write what you know, and I wanted to kind of memorialize that they existed, that that happened. And so that's why I included that, and that my heritage is very important to me. Can I ask you to uh, continue reading where you left off, uh, Brian, and introduce us to some more uh, some more themes in your book? That's absolutely. I'll start. I take another glimpse around the wall. This was our hotel, but I no longer belong. I tuck the paper under my arm and leave. You want me to go? Mickey smiles and motions me over when I push through the doors of the Allegheny County District Attorney's Office. And I got some help from Jeffrey on this. I mean, <laughs> worked there before. Mickey smiles and motions me. The conference room is occupied, but Song is out of the building and says, you were more than welcome to use your office. The detectives, have, the detectives admit you're already in there. I alternate between relieved and irritated that Song isn't here. I thought I might cry some information about the DC lobbyist out of, out of, her, out of her. Sonia's office doesn't appear much different from the last time I was here to pick up the signed divorce papers. Her pit log diploma and license to practice in Pennsylvania 
hung along the wall behind her desk. An impressive addition is her admittance to argue for the U.S. Supreme Court. I, I was told that's really not that an impressive thing, but I thought it was. <laughs> uh, Robo, Keene, and Mitchell are all seated messing with their phones. Keene pockets hers and says, Mr. Feldman, we need to stop running into each other this way. Beware of cops bearing bad jokes. I tap Mitchell on the shoulder. He lays his phone on the table and stands and says, Jason, how are you, my man? How long has it been? I saw him last at my Swarm Song AA meeting seven months ago yesterday. He knows that. It's great to see you again, I say, grasp, grasping his gargantuan hand, which is attached to his six foot seven body that tips the scales at around 270 pounds. Sorry I haven't reached out before, he says. The work dates here are nonstop crazy. He's been being diplomatic. He stopped reaching out in my life to interest in my sobriety. No worries, I say, trying to short circuit the uncomfortable truth which is addicts disappear from the fellowship for a reason, and chasing them down rarely does any good. I believe we are all acquainted, he says, gesturing across the table. The detectives graciously agree to let us, let us do this, so let's not waste their time. King places a mini digital recorder on the conference table. I expect the interview to begin with soft background questions, but the lead is a verbal haymaker for my level. This is officially an attempted murder investigation. What was David doing on the fourth floor of the cathedral morning? What were you what were you doing at the hospital this morning? So that that's the moment that's the moment in the book that really uh, that, that really for me began the, the, the drama. He knows he's in the crosshairs yes. of, the, of the legal system. Uh, but it's also that he, that's also a passage that introduces us to two two other characters that are going to be critical in the book. Uh, one is the criminal justice system uh, and the legal system more broadly, because the protagonist, Jason, is a, uh, a to be polite, a civil attorney, uh, to be impolite, an ambulance chaser. Uh, and then the, the other character and theme that runs through it is the struggle with addiction. Sure. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about both of those things? Sure. I think it's important to, to get out there that I use the ambulance chaser with due deference to all the wonderful finest lawyers that I know. But we write what we know, and when I was struggling with drug and, alcohol, drug and cocaine addiction, I was an ambulance chaser. I was unethical. I did everything I could. They, you know, I still have my license, but it wasn't for lack of trying to lose it uh, in terms of the way I got clients and uh, with chiropractors and uh, baritry. And I don't say that proudly, but it was what I was doing to struggle to fund my, my drug habit. And so I wanted to incorporate a little bit of, of this into Jason. And I didn't go, I don't think I went overboard with it, but Jason does kind of walk the line of respectability and ambulance chasing. So he's not the most likable character to start. He's really not. And it was a struggle to get him to be, if not likable, in the end, at least sympathetic and vulnerable, right? Because what I didn't want to do was follow this, the trope of the Paul Newman and the verdict, or uh, with the movie Goliath, uh, or, or even the, the, the lawyer, uh, although you tend to like him. What's the guy's name? Better call Saul. And, and, and I actually, I look for a little bit of Saul because he's kind of, she's shady, right? But you, you kind of, you know, okay, he's kind of a goofy shady, and, and you, you, you might look for ways to like him. The shady is interesting. Yeah, yeah, so I wanted uh, to Jason to be complicated. That's what I wanted in Jason. And I wanted to portray the legal system as something that was totally, Jason was totally unprepared for when he was made part of it as a defendant. Because we live in a world of privilege, many of us. And if Jason lived in a world of privilege in his own way, in his own way, with the money, even though it was from drug deal, a lot of it's from drug dealing. Talk about that, drug dealing, Uber driver, in addition to his law practice. But uh, he had never been in jail on the other side. He never understood what it was like to be under arrest and have the full weight of the legal system on you and with all eyes only on you. Uh, so I wanted to get that out there as the justice system as, uh, you know, as when someone is privileged. They don't uh, really see what really goes on behind, you know, for those who don't have that privilege, right? And Jason learns when uh, he is arrested, he learns the hard truth when they make him bend over for a cabinet search and in the Allegheny County Jail. 
And what, be a lawyer? Come on, I'm gonna sue you. And they go through that dialogue. So that's what I wanted to accomplish with portraying the justice system. And, and having, having, his, having his AA sponsor be one of the, one of the investigators at the table uh, when, when he comes under the microscope kind of foreshadows a way that Jason is going to have to come to grips with his addiction in order to get to the resolution of his story. Absolutely. But, I mean, I can tell you from, uh, you know, being in the fellowship that uh, the one person you feel completely naked in front of is your sponsor. And so Jason's going to, into that meeting fully intending to, to tell lies about what he knew about uh, his childhood friend falling out of the fourth floor of the cathedral learning and the sponsor sitting right across from him and he's sweating and he gets all nervous because he feels completely exposed not because the cops are there because the sponsor's there now brian we're gonna have to come to grips with a difficult topic now you're in washington dc what what is this about the asshole dc lobbyists that, that's <laughs> a little so harsh isn't it this is a story my wife is familiar with. And in reality, I'm the asshole. I was on a plane back, I was on a plane flight back from DC. And there was a guy across the aisle from me that had his computer up the whole time that we were taking off. And so I get on, I, I sign on the internet, you know, on the flight internet, and I start tweeting about it. And I took a picture of him where I got the logo on his back. But I didn't want him, but I mistakenly got the logo on his back. And it got back to him that I was, you know, on his internet, that I was, this guy's tweeting from you on the same flight. So we go into this Twitter battle. <laughs> and someone says he's a, he's a lobbyist. And uh, so we're going back and forth, right across from each other, <laughs> on this Twitter battle. And he's pulling these, uh, he's pulling these regulations from the any website on what, uh, what's allowed and what you're allowed to have out. And so I tag American Airlines. And I show him the and I say, is he allowed to do this? And they said, no. And then he starts swearing out and he blocked me. So that's where that came from. But in reality, I should have, shouldn't have been the whole monitor. I'm not trying to monitor my own business. But that, that, that's where that came from. So we still have to on Twitter, but you got the last word by uh, putting them in your book. Yes, 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 yes. But that, that is where that came from. We're, we're literally across the house from each other battling on Twitter. <laughs> What else would you like to tell us about uh, about this story and how it came to be? Well, one of the things I always get, I, I get asked about it, I say, Brian, an Uber, this guy's a lawyer, he makes a lot of money, he's an Uber dealer, drug driver, come on. And what I try to, what I try to get across is that the, the, the old saying, it's a cliche, but truth is stranger than fiction, is true, right? One, I've seen lawyers uh, arrested and convicted of distribution of cocaine, heroin, there was one in Allegheny County, he's just got sentenced to five years for marijuana distribution. Yeah. Uh, a very, a very well-known uh, lawyer. And then uh, I know if you go Google Uber, uh, lawyers who drive Uber or whatever the other ones were, you'll see stories. So it, what I tell them, and I say, if I told you this story, I'm gonna tell you in a vacuum, would you believe me? So I say, here's the story I'm gonna tell you, and just try to pretend you didn't hear anything before that. In June of 2006, the Dallas Mavericks were going to the NBA championship for the very first time. My brother Mark owns a team, and he, uh, he bought the team in 2000, and we've had some success, but our first, it was our first trip to the big show. And as you might imagine, I'm gonna get some good seats for those games. I also had the opportunity to get a couple tickets from friends. I called up Mark, I got the tickets, I didn't give them to my friends. No, I didn't sell them on eBay either, <laughs> scalp them. I traded them to my cocaine dealer for $1,000 of cocaine. My cocaine dealer comes to my house, he gives me the tickets, I give, him, I give him the tickets, he gives me this giant bag of cocaine. I go running up to my home office, I dump it out on the desk, look at it. If you've seen Scarface, right? Wanted to go, blah, 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 rub my nose in it. And so I lined some out, and, and, and this was really getting close to the end. I rock on. And uh, so I lined it out. And cocaine had long stopped giving me these feelings that I achieved when I first got get in a bathroom in the summer of uh, 1987 and loved myself for the first time in my life. And so it kind of took over my life because I had to love myself again and again and again. That's a whole other story. But uh, 
I roll it out, and cocaine users are funny bunch, especially in pandemic times. You know, we'll wash our hands, use the pre or elbow, we'll stick a dollar bill up our nose that's been used by God knows who and has God knows why on it. Go figure. But then came the paranoia. Long-term cocaine use is paranoia. Are the cops outside? I go look at the nail check curtains looking out there, you know, there's no one out there. But I'm all paranoid, so I drive to a home improvement store where I buy electrical faceplate outlets and drill in a saw. Say, what if I hit this right? Okay, there we go. And so I, I take these items and I drive them back to my house and I go to the drywall of the closets and I bzz, 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 and I cut these fake electrical outlets in the drywall and all these closets. And I put the cocaine in small reciprocal baggies and I slap it behind the drywall bzz, 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 and cover it all back up thinking I'm the smartest lawyer ever. Like the cops, the EA, the cops, and the drug dogs have never thought of that before. <laughs> And so the next, and so I do some more and again, just pain and shame and paranoia, but never, never an epiphany to get out of problem. Maybe it's just maybe I need to change dealers. And the paranoia again, I go back to the electrical outlets maybe an hour later, bzz, 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 and I take all the cocaine out, put it back in the original Ziploc bag, and flush it all down the toilet. Now I'm not going with the cocaine. The next morning comes, I wake up. Wait a minute, what? Huh? Did I flush all my cocaine down the toilet? There's another game tonight. I call my drug dealer again. He shows up at my house. and said, dude, you did that all last night. I don't want to tell him I flushed it down the toilet like a moron. Yes, I did it all. Give me more. He gives it to me. I give, I, I give him the two tickets, and I go to my brother again. He gives me the cocaine. I go running back up to the home office, rinse, wash, repeat, hide behind the electrical outlets again, bzz, 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 bzz. take it back out again, go to that same bathroom, drop to my knees, like I've done so many times before, hoping or praying for someone or something to take away the shame and this pain and flush it down the toilet again. So if I sat there, if, if, if all I told you was I bought a thousand dollars of cocaine two nights in a row and flushed it down the toilet both those nights, would you believe me? Truth is stranger than fiction. So that is how I wanted to, uh, you know, that is why I felt I could make that work in the animal chase. How did you explain to your brother that you didn't show up for the game? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, yeah I, I think we actually did, because he had this week. But uh, <laughs> those tickets were never intended for that. That's a they good were intended brother. for drugs. That's a good brother. That's yeah, a good brother. I do have a good brother. The, uh, but so, yeah, so that's, uh, you know, that, that's the whole thing, right? The, the goal is, is that you, 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 there are no new plots in the world. Depending on who you ask, so between eight and sixteen plots, no matter what the genre, whether it's literary, whether it's romance, by plot, thriller, doesn't matter. Eight to sixteen plots, and so anything you see, anything you read, is going to follow kind of the hero's journey, or it's going to follow some sort of circle where you know it's going to go from A to B, or redemption, or lost love, finding love, getting back together, and, and it's in movies too. It's, but what you have or what you can create are interesting characters and rich characters, rich scenes in interesting situations. And so that's what I try to do with the Angelus Chaser because dead bodies coming back to haunt the present is nothing new. Alcoholic lawyers are nothing new. So you just try to make it so people whistable, keep turning the page, keep turning the page. I'll ask you a month from now what the Angelus Chaser is about. You know, it's alcoholic lawyer or somebody you know, he gets charged with murder. But did you finish it? Yes. Because the, the greatest compliment I can get is picture, right? That, because it's, I'm, I'm never going to be confused with uh, Ernest Hemingway. So that. Which I misspelled in the book at one time. And that will be corrected in the second print. <laughs> so, last question what's the next page for Brian Keaton? Uh, the next page, I'm working on the sequel called The Body Brokers. It is uh, Jason. Uh, Jason's new girlfriend is found dead of a drug overdose, and his search to find her, uh, he believes it's murder, as that's what he's right. The cops don't believe him, no one believes him, and the search to find her killer, find the truth, uh, takes him into the CD world of re rehab patient body, body brokering, where they go out into homeless populations and they find uh, people who, who are struggling with addiction or aren't even struggling, bring them in and overcharge for services and make millions of dollars. It's kind of a different take on the old Ukrainian auto accident scam from the early 90s and early 2000s where uh, 
uh, the Russian mafia and Ukrainian mafia called Boris, would, uh, you know, especially from Brighton, be the Brighton Beach of Europe where a lot of it happens. They would find, doc they would get doctors on their payroll, chiropractors on their payroll, and they would pay people to go out in cars and slam the brakes uh, in front of the car and then send them to their doctor, and they were making millions and millions of dollars. So it's a, it's a different take on that from a world that I know. Uh, the world of residential treatment, the world of fentanyl, uh, the world of uh, you know, the overdose epidemic, so it will be, it will be sent that way. Ryan Cuban, congratulations on your book. Thanks very Thank much you. for talking with us tonight. Thank you.